Welcome to Guildhall in London, where the great, the good and the glamorous have been arriving for the announcement of the 33rd Booker Prize for Fiction. Earlier this evening in this building, just before the festivities began, the judges under their chairman, the former cabinet minister Kenneth Baker, were locked away in the alderman's courtroom to decide the winner. Good evening. In just 30 minutes' time, we'll be finding out who has won this year's £21,000 Booker Prize for Fiction. The award is open to novelists from the UK, Ireland and the Commonwealth who've published books in the past year in English. And this is the literary event of the year. The room is packed with politicians, literary agents, publishers and, of course, writers. Among them, this year's six shortlisted authors. Favourite to win tonight is Peter Carey, who already has one Booker under his belt. He won in 1988 with Oscar and Lucinda. He's just flown in from New York where he lives and is hoping to make it a double The true history of the Kelly gang, his sympathetic account of the life of the Australian outlaw, Ned Kelly. Ian McEwan is on the Booker shortlist for the third time and like Peter Carey, he's a previous winner. He won for his last book, Amsterdam, just three years ago. This time he's shortlisted for Atonement, the story about a lie and its tragic consequences. In the months since it was published, Atonement has already sold an astonishing 115,000 copies. Andrew Miller's first novel, Ingenious Pain, was festooned with awards. He's on the shortlist with his third, Oxygen, perhaps the most conventional of the books up for tonight's award. In it, the four main characters are all struggling, gasping for air, literally and metaphorically. David Mitchell lives and works in Japan, where his latest book, Number Nine Dream, is set. It's been described as the literary equivalent of Blade Runner and is constructed like a multi-layered video game. Rachel Seifert, the youngest author tonight, is only 30, also lives abroad in Berlin. She's half Australian, half German, and is on the short list with her first novel. The Dark Room is set in Germany and deals with the legacy of Nazism from the 30s to the present day. And finally, the Scottish writer Ali Smith. Hotel World is her second novel and it was shortlisted for the Orange Prize earlier this year. Since she was nominated for the Booker, her sales have doubled. Hotel World is a surreal tale, set in an anonymous chain hotel. In a very short time, one of these six will win the Booker. But first, what about the five judges who've been wrestling with the big decision? Philip Hencher is a literary critic and author. He'll be hoping to be on the list next year with his fourth novel, set in the first Afghan war in the 19th century. Kate Summerscale is the literary editor of the Daily Telegraph and also an acclaimed biographer. Rory Watson is a poet and professor of English. He's also the director of Scottish Studies at the University of Stirling. The novelist and poet Michelle Roberts knows exactly what the six authors must be feeling right now. She was shortlisted nine years ago with her novel Daughters of the House. And finally, the chairman, the former Home Secretary Kenneth Baker. He has edited a myriad of books, including a children's history in verse. This year, the five judges read their way through 121 books and whittled them down to a long list of 24, which was made public for the very first time. Then, just over five weeks ago, they made their final selection. In a moment, I'll be talking to some of tonight's guests about the shortlist. So let's start with Rachel Seifert's The Dark Room and Atonement by Ian McEwan. Ian McEwan's Atonement is the story of Bryony Tallis, a young girl with a powerful imagination and an urge to write, who makes a terrible mistake, which has tragic consequences. At that moment, the urge to be writing was stronger than any notion she had of what she might write. What she wanted was to be lost to the unfolding of an irresistible idea, to see the black thread spooling out from the end of her scratchy silver nib and coiling into words. But how to do justice to the changes that had made her into a real writer at last, and to her chaotic swarm of impressions, and to the disgust and fascination she felt? It is a novel about reckoning at the end of the century, but I think the only way into that, especially in fiction, is to do it at the level of the personal and the emotional. Atonement is not a novel of ideas. I didn't approach it with any specific message I wanted to give the reader. This was a more emotional kind of novel. In many ways, 
and and in and the simplest way, I hope the reader would be moved. The Dark Room by Rachel Seifert is about the children and grandchildren of Nazis and Germany's struggle to come to terms with its past. I have the photo. I can say that's Askan. He was my grandfather, married to my grandmother even then, and father to my mother, and later my grandpa, and all the while a murderer too. How do I know that? Where is my proof? I have no reason not to believe it. There are no pictures of him holding a gun to someone's head, but I'm sure that he did that, and pulled the trigger too. I don't feel that this subject is at all closed. In Germany or in the rest of the world, it's still very much uh, present. As a half-German person growing up in Britain, I often felt that um, the images that one got of ordinary Germans were, um, were the images that the, the Nazis themselves created. Yeah, for me, it never, it never added up to what I knew about my family or f friends in Germany and their families. And, and so for that reason, I guess, I, I just wanted to create for myself, as much as anything, a, a more realistic picture. Well, I've been joined now by the novelist and comedian David Badil, Rosie Boycott, the writer and broadcaster, and the editor of Private Eye, Ian Hislop. Rosie, first of all, a novice against an old-timer, in a sense. Um, what do you think, Rachel Seifert? You know, fantastically powerful writing. Wonderful book, wonderful story. Um, she takes on a massive subject for, for someone in their 20s to say, I'm going to take on the guilt of the Holocaust in the whole of Germany is incredibly ambitious. And she does pull it off. And she has a very worthy place, I think, on this list. There's faults in the book. I found the writing a little bit too spare. But, but, but a great thing, uh, Ian Hislop, that someone like Rachel Seifert is on a short list that yeah, has well, people like Peter Carey and Ian McEwan on it. And, and again, she comes up against another man writing about war, um, but actually, I mean, I think is at least as good. The middle section in both books, he does Dunkirk, she does post-war Germany. That's the best bit of the book, about this bizarre period between the wars ended, but nothing else has happened yet. And the refugee bit in the middle, I think, is really, really good. But what about uh, Ian McEwan? Many say this is his best book. Oh, I think it probably is his best book. It's certainly much better, I think, than Amsterdam, that won the Booker Prize in 1998. It's a very, very clever book. It is a book about writing, and there have been many books about writing, but it's so cleverly structured about writing. I think it probably is his best book. I think it's in with a good shot of winning. Do you, do you worry about the trick at the end? Or? Yeah, I mean, I, I said before on the People's Booker, I don't like the writing about writing. But even having said that, it's fantastically readable. Um, and the, the, the character of the ghastly little girl who turns into the, the ghastly old woman author is pretty, pretty powerful. So what do you think? Between those two, if you had to, which one would it be? Ian McEwan, without a doubt. Ian McEwan? And what about the newcomer? Here we go. A bet for the newcomer. Well, now we move on to Hotel World by Ali Smith and Oxygen by Andrew Miller. Hotel World by Ali Smith is the story of a ghost, five women, and one night in a metropolitan hotel. The hotel is a gift of a metaphor for any writer. It is architectural. There it is. It's literal. It's solid. It's social. And yet it is transient. It's about spending one night in a place um, and then being gone the next day. Lise, excited, cannot decide whom to call to tell about her act of letting a homeless person have a room in the hotel for the night. The friends who would understand what she's done all work for the hotel too, and could mindlessly or mindfully betray her to authorities. Other friends who don't work for Global wouldn't understand its full rebellious significance and the combination of temerity and courage it has taken. This evening, Lise, by inviting a homeless person to reside in the hotel for the night free of charge, has probably broken all Global quality policy. In doing this, she has made herself feel better. It's a book really about the iniquity of the, uh, the boxes, the labels, the categorizations that we put on ourselves and others. Um, a book about the kind of the connections and the disconnections between the spirit and the material. And really a book about how fast life is, how fast it goes. Andrew Miller's Oxygen is about two sons, their dying mother, and a Hungarian playwright living in Paris, all at a pivotal moment in their lives. Oxygen is made up out of several obsessions that were in my life three, four years ago. One of those obsessions was breathing. Um, and all the characters in Oxygen have various breathing difficulties. 
but for those characters who don't actually have a sort of uh, a pathology, don't actually have a, have a medical condition, their breathing problems are to do with their lack of freedom, their shoulders are closed, they can't open up and take those big deep breaths that you can take when you are at one with things. He did not feel tired. He sat in the light of the remaining candle. The Calvados had given him slight heartburn and the discussion of happiness had set him off on an arc of thinking he would have to reach the end of before he could rest. It was true, the stories in themselves were somewhat banal. A fish, a tin of soup, running out of a bar, a soccer match. But happiness was a subject as elusive as love, and one that required a similar subtlety of Lexus and category. In his uh, two novels, one certainly more conventional, but one entirely experimental. Did you enjoy both equally? Um, yes, I think the Ali Smith starts terribly well with this sort of dead girl describing being dead, and that is, that's fairly different. She's killed herself and a dumb waiter in the hotel. And the, um, the book sort of gets going, but then there's a soggy bit in the middle, and then it ends again with a sister, which is particularly powerful, with a description of Groove. Just put the front of and the back together and it would have been yeah. wonderful. I mean, you know, it's terribly good writing, um, but I just think it doesn't quite hold as a book. I like the Oxygen book a lot. I mean, this is the one I championed before. Um, and I think the portrait of the, the dying mother and the reaction of the two sons in the beginning is, is quite extraordinary. Uh, David Biddy, picking up on um, Hotel World, you know, the idea that there's five characters in this book and they're knitted together in the container of the hotel. Mm, yeah. Did it feel like a novel to you? or just a No, series? it felt more like an extended prose poem to me in, in five or actually six different voices, yeah. but beautifully written. A lot of it is very beautifully written and actually, as a prose poem, it's thematically very consistent and very, very well structured. As a story, it hasn't got much going for it, but I don't think that's the point of the book. No, I mean, it seems to be the, is the ideas of loss and belonging and alienation as well. Did you, did you get absorbed by Hotel World? No, I didn't. And I think they're actually these two books are a good group because I think they're the two that don't make it structurally. They're both written by masters of their art who I think will go on to write great books. Ali Smith writes some um, wonderful and unforgettable characters, but they don't hold all together. Um, in Oxygen, you had two books, really, um, waiting to get together, and they never happen. I felt deeply frustrated at the end of it, and I, I don't think either of them really are quite fully realised novels. I agree with that. I both of them write beautiful sentences, I think. Beautiful but, sentences, yeah. lovely prose, but as structural efforts, they fail. So perhaps Ali Smith over Andrew Miller on this one? I'd give it to Ali Smith just because I think she's a more interesting writer and she's, she takes risks and I think she has a wonderful flair with language. I'd right. give it to Andrew Miller. Right? I'll give it to uh, Ali Smith. Good. Well, on to the last two books on the list are The True History of the Kelly Gang by Peter Carey and Number Nine Dream by David Mitchell. David Mitchell's Number Nine Dream is the story of a young Japanese man who travels to Tokyo to search for the father he has never met. Writing the book was a, um, was a process of writing through three lenses, I think. A uh, uh, lens of age. I'm much older than my protagonist, A.G. Len, um, a lens of culture. I'm writing in Japan, about Japan, and I'm not Japanese. But maybe most importantly, yes, a lens of language. I try to write in a cool and an even and a level way, as though the book is already a well-crafted translation. I'm in Tokyo to find my father. You know his name and you know his address, and you are going to give me both right now. A galaxy of cream and ribbons in my coffee cup, and the background chatter pulls into focus. My first morning in Tokyo, and I'm already getting ahead of myself. The Jupiter Cafe sloshes with lunch hour laughter. Drones bark into mobile phones, and she drones hitch up sagging voices to sound more feminine. True History of the Kelly Gang by Peter Carey is the story of the Australian outlaw Ned Kelly told in his own words. The great thing about this story is that there are these little bits of action, these little bits of story that we know. But between those bits, there's all this area of unimagined dark. So what I was interested in doing was really imagine, imagining what happened in the darkness. So I would say, if you want to put a number on it, I would say it's about 98% made up. But it really respects the 2% <laughs> that we know. I lost my own father at 12 years of age and know what it is to be raised on lies and silences. My dear daughter, you are presently too young to understand a word I write. 
but this history is for you and will contain no single lie may I burn in hell if I speak false. God willing, I shall live to see you read these words, to witness your astonishment and see your dark eyes widen and your jaw drop when you finally comprehend the injustice we poor Irish suffered in this present age. It's about a question, really. And the question is, who are we? Who are we Australians? That this man uh, should be our greatest hero. No doubt that uh, Peter Kelly just thinks that Ned Kelly's the best thing, but tell me, do you think these are two books, history versus modernity? Yeah, that's true. I mean, uh, Number Nine Dream is a very modern book. I mean, it's got, it's very kind of pulp written. It's got lots about Tokyo, lots about video games, that kind of stuff. And uh, the, the Kelly Gang is, is a real out and out historical novel, all written in Ned Kelly's voice. And actually, I've read Ned Kelly's letters. So there was one letter that was published, and it's written absolutely in that voice. It's an incredible feat of literary ventriloquism. Do you uh, mind the fact that Peter Carey is so clearly with his character and every sympathy with him? No, no, I think it's wonderful. And I think that the criticism people have made that they don't get another voice apart from Ned Kelly's, I think, well, what the hell with that? It is Ned Kelly's story and he's told it. And I think the fact that he's, he's put kind of poetry into the mouth of someone who is essentially uneducated and the descriptions and the story, once you're in the rhythm, it's a quite magical book. What about number nine dream, the idea of all these different layers? You think you're in the middle of the story, then you have another layer to get to, and then another layer. It's a hard workbook. You don't you can't just sort of read it and then put it down. You have to stick with it. I really liked it in the end. I think he's a writer of fantastic power, fantastic imagination, and he's created in there some unforgettable characters. Like the little boy, the hero who goes to look for his dad. He's he grows up in front of your eyes, all the right things about a novel, the impact of life, and you love him at the end. It's he's very clever. Are these both essentially about storytelling? I mean, the story in number 19 kind of gets buried in the yes. style. Yes, I mean, in, in a number of tricks in terms of how he is going to do the narrative. I kind of, I found it difficult. Um, and I wasn't in great sympathy with the characters or indeed um, with any of the storytelling. I quite like the bit about the war in the middle. I mean, everybody's doing war. Um, and he did a kamikaze, sort of kamikaze boat mm. person, um, which was new, and that was quite interesting. I'm sure he does write well, and he'll write something that's slightly more accessible. The Carey, I thought, um, unlike you, I thought was rather one-dimensional. Um, it makes a great monologue. It's fantastic to read. Um, and obviously it would be great as a play or in performance. But, but as don't a you novel, think his characterisation is sure. very rich about the mother and also the sense about the, 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 the outlaw, the bush ranger that teaches Yes, I mean, it's all powers. terribly readable. Um, but I, I mean, I don't want to repeat myself, but I found um, the idea that this was just Carey being Kelly a bit limiting. I'd have liked a bit more around it in terms of David, other perspective. David, do you want to take a quick final word? Well, I just think the voice is very beautiful, as you were saying. It's very kind of tough and lyrical, this kind of outback poetry. OK, at this point I have to say, who do you think is going to win? Uh, Andrew Miller. He'll squeeze in between the favourites. Uh -huh. Ian McEwan. Ian McEwan and? I think Peter Kerr is going to win. OK, a different choice from each one, and indeed we're going to be speaking to our guests later. Now let's hear from the man whose whole life is about deciding the odds, Bookie Graham Sharp. How have our literary runners and writers been doing? Well, the hot favourite didn't even make it to the shortlist, Beryl Bainbridge, but in her absence, Peter Carey has emerged as the punter's favourite at 6-4, to four, closely followed by Ian McEwan at 15-8. to eight. There's a strong tip for Andrew Miller at 11 to 2 third favourite. Rachel Seifert is the 13 to 2 fourth favourite. And the two outsiders that really haven't registered with the punters, both at 11 to 1, Ali Smith and David Mitchell. So how have things changed in the last couple of weeks? There's been a run for Peter Carey. It was originally he and Ian McEwan were the, were the joint favourites, but he's just edged in front, I think possibly because of the... Uh, the fact that he won another award in Australia has just, just uh, pushed it in his favour. So who do you think is going to win? Ian McEwan. You're sure? No, I'm not sure. Rachel will see if it could beat him. Thanks very much indeed. Well, whatever odds Graham books in the books, whatever their place on the bestsellers lists, it's the judges who are all powerful tonight. So what does it take to be a judge? We've been talking to people who've done the job in the past and been watching the process through the eyes of one of this year's bunch, Philip Hensher. Well, it's July now, and it's probably about three or four months to go. I've probably read about 60 or 70 novels, um, probably got about 50 or 60 to go. Um, it feels as though I'm very, very deep in the jungle now, um, with no real way out. Somehow you still kind of get up in the morning, you still kind of think maybe today's the day, maybe, you know, the next novel that, um, that comes out of the box. Maybe it will be, you know, it will be the new little dot. You never know. In 
in the beginning, uh, there were an awful lot of books arriving on a weekly basis. I mean, boxes of ten books, you know, would turn up every two days. And you, you become incredibly overawed at just the sheer volume and you, you start to panic and think, I don't know how I'm going to get through this, there's just no way. When I did it, I had two small children and um, I suddenly realised, you know, um, that I'd still got a very large number of novels left to read and there were only kind of 20-odd days to go and I worked out I actually now had to read two books a day. It's seven o'clock this afternoon. We're just going to go into... Um, argue over the long list, which I think is going to be about 20 books, but uh, we'll see how it goes. Um, and uh, I've done all my reading, so I'm feeling a bit pleased with myself. Well, we've picked the long list for the prize, and I'm rather thrilled because um, I got all my choices onto the long list, or pretty well all my choices, and didn't lose any books that I really liked. Um, very amicable meeting, actually. In 1974, uh, there was um, a Kingsley Amis submitted, and one of the judges, Elizabeth Jane Howard, was, of course, at that time, Kingsley's wife. And we realised there was a conflict here. And when, finally, we reached the book, uh, Elizabeth Jane Howard said... I do realise I can't stay in the room because um, this, is, this is by um, Kingsley and I'm perfectly happy to leave you two to um, discuss this further. It's, I mean, easily the best thing that Kingsley's ever written, but I mustn't say anything and I'll go, and she went. Well, I know that the Booker can be quite acrimonious and there have been all kinds of reported battles over the years, but I think that anything that we could have done was dwarfed whilst I was judging the booker by the sheer volume of fury directed at the fact that I'd been nominated as a judge. So uh, the greatest scandal about the booker in the year 2000 was that they had the audacity to pick some useless woman like me. I'm pleased in some ways in that I went in with a mental shortlist in my mind of six books, um, four of which have got on the shortlist. Um, unfortunately, the two that didn't get on the shortlist were probably my two favourites, which is the Philip Pullman, which I'm very sorry to lose, and the Nick Hornby, which I think is a mistake to leave off. I really think it was a mistake to leave off. I think it's a kind of serious, grand novel. In retrospect, I now feel that on the day that our shortlist was announced, I should have resigned. The book that I had liked most of all, loved out of all the books that we'd read, didn't even make the shortlist. And I think at that point, I should have just said, my feelings aren't reflected in this shortlist. I shouldn't go on with this process. But I had by then sort of got into this strange sense of responsibility, this onerous sense, almost as though you'd had to take on some sort of cabinet-like responsibility for the future of this prize. I mean, it was quite absurd. And I felt that it would be sort of disloyal to break ranks at this point. I think one of the most shocking, but using the word shocking not in a pejorative sense necessarily, things that um, have happened during the course of all Booker judging, was that when Beryl Bainbridge was a judge, because the judges, as you know, sit round a table, uh, myself and the five judges, but Beryl uh, said that she felt very much more comfortable, I can't remember whether she had back trouble at that time or not, lying down. And so she... Uh, did all her judging from the carpet, speaking upwards towards the other judges. Novels read, 150. Novels enjoyed, 12. Cigarettes smoked, about 7,000. Bottles of wine drunk, about 9,000. I feel a bit like Bridget Jones now at the end of this kind of grim year. I've enjoyed it, I've enjoyed it, but it's been a slog. It has been a slog, and if I don't get my way, then I'm going to start to think that it hasn't really been worth it at all. Okay. Well, now that Martin's here, and Rory's has eventually arrived from Scotland, we're all here, we've got an hour, I'm afraid you have to go. 
the secret history of judges. Well, the chairman of the judges, Kenneth Baker, has just begun his speech in the Great Hall. And in a few moments, we'll be joining him as he announces the winner of this year's Booker Prize. But I've come into the old library here at Guildhall because I've also got a winner to announce. This year, for the very first time, we gave you the chance to vote for who you think should win. And a big thank you to all the people who voted for the first ever People's Booker. And I'm delighted to announce that the winner is Ian McEwen for Atonement. Earlier on today, I went to Oxford to get his reaction. Ian McEwen, you've won the People's Booker. Um, do you regard this as an accolade? Well, I am really rather thrilled. I mean, I know that matters of literary judgment can't be settled democratically, but still, it suggests to me that people have read the book and have voted for it. Uh, so, yes, I'm, I'm genuinely thrilled. You've had phenomenal success with this novel, over 100,000 sales in less than a month. I mean, what is this new audience? What do you put it down to? It's something of a mystery. I've never had a hardback book sell like <laughs> this. Uh, I get letters every day from readers, and they're all concentrating on different things. Uh, some were alive during the Dunkirk retreat. Uh, some grew up before the war. Some are great lovers of Rosamund Lehman and Elizabeth Bowen and see this as a book about literature more than anything else. Do you think it's a book about literature? Well, it is centrally a book about storytelling, so that's... Um, important and that comes through in these letters. What really does come through too is how literate, you, you read all these articles about the dumbing down of the world, but people have read a lot it seems to me. It reads like it flowed off the pen. Did it come easily to you? No, it was really hard to get it going, especially the first uh, half, the half set in the country house. It was one of those books that was not planned ahead. I started with a scrap, uh, just a girl entering a room looking for a vase, aware of a boy outside gardening, and built it slowly up from there. The Dunkirk passage, on the other hand, which is a self-enclosed, almost like a novella, um, did write itself very much in, on, on the hoof, two months for that. But then the hospital sequence and, and the end and the reflection on the whole book, again, was very, very difficult. But here you're on the shortlist for the third time. Are you nervous about tonight? Well, I try not to be nervous, and I try to think, uh, well, you know, my work is done, the book is written, but the booker does teach you how to be nervous. It indoctrinates you, so by the time the pudding comes round, you feel really sick. <laughs> Ian McEwen, thank you very much. Thank you. So congratulations again to Ian McEwen for winning the first ever People's Booker. And now we'll return to Kenneth Baker in the Great Hall, because in a couple of minutes we're going to hear who has won this no year's Booker Prize no for pictures. Fiction and they sell in their hundreds of thousands and indeed millions, not bad for a dying art form. The judges were glad to include, in their, in, to include the last volume of Pullman's trilogy on the long list this year, the first time that a book written for children but read by adults has been recognized by the booker. <clears throat> Three things have struck me about the books that I've read this year. First, in many of them, children were the main character, not the appendages of their parents, but the centre of the action, for the psychology of a child growing up is absolutely fascinating. And so we've read about children who were bright but not intellectual, impulsive, dishonest and greedy, but also brave, generous and loving. And some who were so viciously malign that we never wished they reached adolescence. Secondly, the setting of the novel has moved on from the First World War. There were many novels set in the Second World War where the centre of attraction were not the combatants but the civilians. And there were also lots of novels set in the 1950s, the 1960s and the 1970s, a period that is close enough to evoke personal memories but distant enough to know that we did things differently then. And that distancing, in my view, will become greater after the events of September the 11th. And that period is a period that is assuming almost the aura of a golden age. Thirdly, I have been struck by the number of novels this year which were concerned with the problems of displacement. People who decided to leave one culture, one society, one religion and one country and go to another one that was totally alien to them. In the past, they were called emigres. Today, they're called refugees. Novelists, yes, do respond to the turmoil of the world today. This 
year, ladies and gentlemen, has been an exceptional year for the novel. I was struck by the sheer quality of much of the writing and the imagination of the writers as they struggled with the crooked timber of humanity. And of the six novels that are on the shortlist, all of them are highly readable, including the ones that are experimental. And all of them tell a good story, because at the heart of the novel is the art of storytelling. In his true history of the Kelly gang, Peter Carey has turned Ned Kelly into the Robin Hood of Australia. And Kelly tells his story in a direct, vigorous vernacular, which Carey sustains brilliantly throughout the whole of the book. And I am sure that this will become an icon in Australia. In Ian McEwan's Atonement, a 13-year-old girl on a very hot summer day in 1935 sends an innocent man to jail through a malicious lie. We meet him again in 1940 in the retreat to Dunkirk, and we meet her again as a celebrated novelist today seeking atonement. But can she ever atone? McEwan's powerful imagination has created three totally believable worlds. And, but this is a novel of startling surprises, and it deals with the very nature of what is fiction and what is not. Andrew Miller, in his third novel, Oxygen, tells of three men who are, failing, who are facing up to the fact of their failures and inadequacies in their, inadequacies in their past. At one crucial moment in their lives, they failed. They failed to be resolute and they recover their masculinity through the discovery of courage. That is, their mascul that, is, that is their oxygenation. Miller really asks what really constitutes the fulfilled life and what is the nature of happiness. David Mitchell, in his second novel, Number Nine Dream, tells of a young man searching for his father in Tokyo. This is an ambitious novel of fantasy, cascading with ideas and images which tumble upon the page in a quite fascinating way. And Mitchell makes us share his hero's dreams, his hopes, and his anxieties. Rachel Seifert, in her first novel, The Dark Room, describes how three young uh, Germans react to the horrors of Nazism. It deals with the whole question of collective guilt and individual responsibility. In the middle section of this book, where a young girl of 12 takes her younger brothers and sisters on a long trek across ravaged Germany from uh, Munich to Hamburg in 1945, is one of the most compelling and moving uh, sustained uh, passages of narrative in any of the books we've read this year. Hotel World, the second novel by Ali Smith, describes how the lives of five young women are interlinked, interlinked during one night in a rather seedy hotel. And the thing that brings them together is the accidental death of a chambermaid. And in a quite dazzling way, her ghost and the other characters reveal their daydreams, meditate on, on mortality, and expose their inner lives. This is a beautiful prose poem. Now, I think at this stage I must ask Mr. Bill Gimsey to come up, please, because he's going to actually present the prize. He's Mr. Money. He's the chief executive of the Iceland Group. This is the moment... Uh, <laughs> this is the moment when I open the envelope and tell you who has won. But first... I must tell you how difficult it has been for the judges. Ruskin said that books can be divided into two classes, the books of the hour and the books of all time. Each of the novelists this year are writing at the peak of their powers, and I have no doubt that their books will be in the second category. Many of these books, all of these books, will be read for years to come. Peter Carey's novel and Ian McEwan's novel in the judge, view of the judges, are the best books they've ever written and are superior to the books with which they won the Booker Prize some years ago. <laughs> Andrew Miller, David Mitchell and Ali Smith have also written their very best books for this year. And while it is clear that Rachel Seifert's first book must be her best, nonetheless, this is an outstanding literary achievement. But there has to be a winner. And this year, it is Peter Carey, The True History of the Kelly Gang. So, Peter Carey has won the Booker Prize of the year 2001.
with the true history of the Ned Kelly gang. Peter Carey has wanted to write this novel for more than 30 years. He believes that Ned Kelly is Australia's great hero, and he said so when he spoke to us earlier. I thought I was so calm. But you see, now I have this, and I realize how deeply in debt I am. I'm really in debt to Ian McEwan, who I now have to buy a very expensive dinner for, because we had a wage. I'm really in debt because my younger son, Charlie, who came with us from New York, somehow or other, persuaded me that if I should win this prize, he would get $50. <laughs> and also because our other son, Sam, who's decided to stay in New York, will obviously have to have $50 too. I'm also in debt to a lot of people for um, Deborah Rogers, who's been my agent since, well, never mind. And Faber and Faber, who have been my publishers in this country for a very, very long time, I, I think since 79. And Robert McCrum, who's here tonight, who was my reckless editor at that time. And my Australian publishers, who are not here, have also been my publishers for since about 74. And I wish they could be here, but they're not, because they all helped in the process. My Australian publisher, Laurie Muller, came on a camping trip. and. Uh, taught me things about horses I wish I could forget. Um, and I'm also very, I'm indebted to my wife, Alison Summers, my first reader, um, who encouraged me to write this book at a time when I was foolishly trying to write a novel about New York, uh, which I love but know nothing about really. And, and who was in, on many occasions my editor. And particularly the, the wonderful thing about tonight when I really, really am really in shock is to have Gary Fisker John, my editor from Knopf in New York here. And people say there are no great editors in the world anymore. Well, I think he is one, and he's a total lunatic and obsessive. He's somebody who loves literature so much it's almost impossible to comprehend, and who labored over each sentence of my book to a degree that, well, if I was 30 years old, I really would have shot him. But I'm old and mature now, so I really did appreciate it. And that's really about it. And um, we'd all like you to come visit us in New York, please, because we need you. OK, bye. So a speech from Peter Carey thanking everybody for contributing to his book that won the award tonight. Uh, Rosie Boycott. Well, I think it's great. I think it's a wonderful book, and uh, I think it's a fabulous result. You know, there are so many books written about Ned Kelly, and yet here's another one that comes forward and just yeah. takes it by the throat, <laughs> the, whole, the whole vision of Ned Kelly. Yeah, and gives it's a the only book I've read about Ned Kelly. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and me just... too, actually. Yeah. <laughs> so I haven't read loads. Oh, good, you have. I've read have been loads. <laughs> yeah. Ian Hislop. Um, Perhaps not your, your choice, but no, you understand have been my why favorite. it would have No, I mean, it's a perfectly enjoyable read, and I mean, you know, good is one, but I thought there were a couple of other better books. Do you think that what he said was true about writing about something he knew about was very, very important, and that often writers bring a different sensibility when they actually... I suppose it was true of a number of the books tonight, you know, you know people wrote about death, about illness, about... Yes. It, that he actually has a voice, a particular voice that yes, he wants. he goes back and minds it, and he may live in New York, but he's better at writing about Australia. That's very honest. Um, and but I think the bloke who writes about Japan lives in Japan, and the but German he's not girl Japanese, writes, and he writes about Japan. Yeah. So, I mean, they are essentially writing about what they know. But great books always do come from somebody really, really knowing what they're talking and about, and living and breathing it. There he is. There he is, the man <laughs> himself. Is. Well we have to congr congratulations. Well congratulations. That's fantastic. Well, it's... Doesn't get any easier or less wonderful, I must say. <laughs> so, you know, Oscar and Lucinda was way back in uh, 1988. Yeah. So tell me, have you really been carrying around a little piece of paper with Ned Kelly's oh, well, speech? Well, I actually didn't carry it around, but I really did 
I did type it up very carefully a long time ago. Somewhere in the middle of my life I lost it, but I never forgot it. And uh, that certainly did shape the way this book was written. It certainly, it reads brilliantly in the sense that you don't notice there is no punctuation. Well, thank you so much. I mean, it's a, it was a, it's a sort of a scary business to get into. You don't, the comma's a useful instrument and you, and you really don't want to throw it away. But, um, and it's not, it's not easy, of course, to write a sentence without one, but... Anyway. But it works. Yeah. And tell me, you've already offered your two sons uh, $50 each. <laughs> what are you going to do? A.S. Byatt bought a swimming pool with us. What are you going to do with the money? Oh, uh, well, they, they, they go to private school in Manhattan. That'll be enough, I think. Well, Peter Kane, yeah. very many congratulations okay, thank you for so winning much. tonight. Thank you. thank you. Well, that's all from this year's Booker Prize for Fiction Awards ceremony. Congratulations again to Peter Carey, and good night from all of us from Guildhall.